Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about caffeine. Now, caffeine is present, of course, in coffee and tea and in the cola beverages and in small amounts in solid foods and chocolate and cocoa-containing foods and beverages and certain sweets and snacks. And for a while, it was sold combined with alcohol in one container. But unfortunately, there were some problems. And the problem was that the drowsiness associated with alcohol was counteracted by the alertness due to the caffeine so people would drink more alcohol they didn't realize how much they were consuming and then they got into trouble so the FDA mandated that that be stopped but the caffeine is added sometimes to certain juices and waters and cookies and hot sauces and lip balms and eye creams, a variety of other products where it probably doesn't do much good. Now, the FDA has explicitly allowed addition of caffeine only to the cola drinks. Now, sometimes the manufacturers have taken a little liberty with that permission and have added it to those other products that I mentioned. The FDA mandates that a notation be present on the label if caffeine is added. Doesn't say they have to add the amount or put the amount on the label, but there are lots of ways around that. So one of them is if the caffeine happens to be part of guarana or if it happens to be part of cocoa, don't have to list it. Well, you can purchase the caffeine in ways that maybe you're not aware of. So if you want one of those pills that make you more alert, maybe you want to take a no-dose or a Vivarin, contain somewhere between 100 and 200 milligrams of caffeine, or you want to go on a diet, so you take some Hydroxycut or Dexatrim, or you use some of the Nutrisystem shakes, they contain somewhere between 50 and 200 milligrams of caffeine. Now we've known about coffee that's the major source of the caffeine that we consume. It was discovered in Ethiopia in about 850 AD, cultivated in Yemen. It was consumed as a beverage for the first time in the middle of the 15th century. Then it went to Europe through some Venetian merchants. That was in the early part of the 1600s, and then it was disseminated throughout the world. So caffeine is one of the most frequently ingested pharmacologic substances that we know of. Uh, FDA estimates that somewhere between 80-85% of the United States adults consume caffeine every day. And because of the frequency of consumption, it's very important to know what the health risks associated with caffeine are because with such a large number of people consuming caffeine, if it's harmful, well, that has significant implications. But remember, even though it's a psychoactive drug, it's a natural ingredient, present, of course, in the coffee and the tea, mildly addictive. In the United States, somewhere about 85% of people consume at least one cup of day. The average consumption of caffeine is somewhere around 160 to 200 milligrams a day. The, actually, the peak consumption is in people between the ages of 50 and 65. They consume about 225 milligrams a day. Coffee is the major source of caffeine for adults in all age groups. On the other hand, in the pediatric population, people less than age 18, the carbonated beverages account for somewhat more than 50% of the caffeine consumed. Chocolate foods, beverages, they contain about 35, 40% of all of the caffeine that people consume, and then tea is 5 to 10%. So the peak intake of caffeine isn't within the United States. Actually, it's in Finland, Norway, and the United Kingdom. The United States ranks 22 on the list of caffeine. We only consume about a third of what they do in Finland. Actually, we consume about a half of what they consume in the United Kingdom and in Sweden. And in spite of that, we rank number 22 in the world. So the average caffeine, if we look at people throughout the world, is about 70 milligrams a day here in the United States. We peak out at around 225 milligrams a day. In Finland and Sweden, the United Kingdom, they consume more than 400 milligrams a day. Now, we get caffeine from 103 different species of the coffee plant.
there are two types that account for the overwhelming majority. That's 99% of the coffee that's consumed. It's just from two of the different types. There's the caffea arabica, that's low bitterness and low caffeine, somewhere between 70 and 120 milligrams a cuff. And the cafe cafora, and the cafe canfora, or the robusta, that's got a higher caffeine content. It contains somewhere between about 130 and 220 milligrams per cup, grown in 60 different tropical and subtropical countries. We have roasted coffee, and the roasted coffee actually contains a lot more than the caffeine. It contains more than a thousand bioactive compounds, some that have potential therapeutic effects. So some are antioxidants, anti-inflammatory agents, antifibrotic agents, stop the production of scar tissue or collagen, anti-carcinogenic. So among the ingredients that have been studied the most are, of course, the caffeine and the chlorogenic acid. We also studied the dipterpenes, that's cafestol and kawiol. Well, those dipterpenes, they're very important in detoxifying carcinogens and boosting the intracellular antioxidants. Chlorogenic acid actually is the most common, most abundant antioxidant in the coffee, but unfortunately it's degraded in the roasting process. Then we also have a variety of flavonoids. We have the catechins and the anthrocyanidins and the hydroxycinamic acid, ferulic acid, caffeic acid a variety of other substances it's suggested that we don't consume more than 400 milligrams if you're a healthy adult, if you're a pregnant woman. The advice from the ACOG, American College of Obstetricians, Gynecologists, through the authorities in the United Kingdom say 200 milligrams max you should consume. In Canada they say if you're pregnant you could consume up to 300 milligrams. There have been some reports, don't know how accurate they really are, of increased pregnancy losses in people who consume a significant amount of caffeine in the first trimester, the suggestion of seizures in adults who were exposed in utero to the caffeine, some reports of a decrease in IQ at age five to people whose mothers consumed caffeine. It's suggested that adolescents don't consume more than 100 to 175 milligrams of caffeine a day, and if you're between the ages of 6 and 12, you should keep the caffeine level down to somewhere between about 45 and 85 milligrams. Is it possible to get a toxic dose? They make a powder, powder of caffeine. One tablespoon contains about 10,000 milligrams of caffeine compared to a cup of coffee that contains somewhere between 80 and 175 milligrams. Well, yes, you can get in trouble. So with one tablespoon of the powdered caffeine, you could get as much caffeine as is present in somewhere between 50 and 100 cups of coffee. That's potentially lethal. So how much is in a typical brewed cup of coffee? somewhere between about 130 and 175 milligrams. If you have a dark roast coffee, actually has slightly less caffeine than the lighter roasts. If you have the instant coffee, well, that's going to contain about 90 milligrams. If you have the black tea, brewed black tea, somewhere between 40 and 70 milligrams. Green tea, somewhat less. Iced tea, the same as green tea. If you have espresso, just two ounces of espresso, that's 80 milligrams. So obviously on a dose-related basis, that's relatively high content. You have decaffeinated coffee, it still contains caffeine. It contains anywhere between 3 and 12 milligrams a cup. If you go over to Starbucks and you get 16-ounce Starbuck Grand, well, that's going to contain about 330 milligrams as compared to, say, a two-ounce shot of five-ounce of five-hour energy, well, that contains about 215 milligrams. Other energy drinks anywhere between 30 and 400 milligrams. If you consume a Coca-Cola, 20-ounce Coke has about 60 milligrams. You get one tablet of caffeine, contain anywhere between 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams. Now they even have it in Excedrin, 65 milligrams. There are some benefits to consuming caffeine. So it increases the alertness, increases the mood and the focus, increases your ability to remain awake, improves your memory consolidation. 
And actually, if it's added to either acetaminophen or ibuprofen at a dose of somewhere between 100 and 130 milligrams, you get a boost in the pain relief of about 5 to 10 percent. And if you happen to go up to a relatively high location where acute mountain sickness is an issue, well, if you consume enough caffeine within a couple hours of getting there, you can abort the acute mountain sickness. It decreases fatigue, it decreases drowsiness, increases the reaction time, increases the wakefulness and concentration, increases your motor coordination if you don't have too much. Of course, varies with the dose. Seems to get the desired effect about an hour after you consume it, lasts about three to four hours. There's a decrease in the mistakes in shift workers if they consume caffeine. It seems to increase the aerobic capacity in endurance sports, increases the ability of the muscles to work under anaerobic conditions when you've used up all the oxygen. Seems that a moderate dose, about 350 milligrams for a 150 pound individual, that's going to improve the sprint performance, improve the uh, cycling and uh, running time. It's going to delay the muscle fatigue and the central fatigue. It's going to increase the basal metabolic rate. And actually, it's been shown that people who consume coffee, a couple cups a day, have a decrease in the likelihood of Alzheimer's disease, a decrease in the rate of cognitive decline, a decrease in the rate of suicide and stroke in older women. And actually, the National Cancer Institute followed 400,000 men and women for 10 years. They began studying them when they were between the ages of 50 and 70. And what they found was, compared to non-drinkers, those people who consume caffeine seemed to have a lower rate of death, lower rate of death related to heart disease, respiratory disease, stroke and injury and diabetes and infection, and even from accidents. So if you consume enough caffeine, it's going to decrease your energy intake and it's going to increase your energy expense, hence the use in weight loss products. It improves the weight maintenance by increasing the amount of calories that your muscles will burn, something we call thermogenesis, increases the amount of epinephrine, increases the satiety, increases the fatty acid oxidation, increases the heat that's produced in the skeletal muscle, seems to decrease the incidence of diabetes, decrease the incidence of cirrhosis and Parkinson's disease, well, decreases the incidence of certain kind of cancers as well. So it can decrease the incidence of cancer of the endometrium, the uterus, the womb, the prostate, the colon and rectum, the liver, can decrease the symptoms of depression, decrease the suicidal risk, decrease the overall mortality if you consume two to three or four cups a day. They did a study in the British Medical Journal in 2017. They looked at people who drank three to four cups of coffee a day, and they found that there was somewhere between a 15 and 20 percent decrease in all-cause mortality, death from cardiovascular disease, death from heart disease, decrease in death from cancer, there was no association with hypertension, so it didn't cause people to become hypertensive. And there was a slight increase in the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, the LDL, and the triglyceride. And that had to do with the dipterines that were present only in boiled coffee, not in instant coffee, not in filtered coffee. And even though there was a slight increase in the cholesterol, the amount that a person had to consume was relatively high in comparison to the amount you would consume to get the benefits, the anti-carcinogenic effects, and the overall effect? Well, it seems like we have a significant decrease in the rate of cardiovascular disease, decrease in cardiovascular death, so the little potential for increase in cholesterol and LDL doesn't seem to be so bad. And additionally, the caffeine decreased the incidence of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis by almost 30 percent, decreased the incidence of diabetes by about 30 percent, decreases the incidence of kidney stones, helps protect against cataracts, decreases the muscle pain after a workout, gives you a better sense of well-being and sociability, and some people just get a buzz because of the flavor. There's no relation to an increase in glucose in the bloodstream, no increase in duodenal ulcers. Might give you a little indigestion. 
but yes, it does indeed have the potential for an adverse effect as far as the cholesterol, as far as the blood pressure is concerned, as far as the homocysteine is concerned. But remember, it's more than offset by the benefits you get from the caffeine. Now, some people seem to be sensitive to the amount of caffeine. And some people, when they have even a small amount of caffeine, they're going to get a headache or nausea or hypertension or they're going to have some anorexia, some loss of appetite or restlessness. They're going to have increased GI motility. Short term, if you haven't had any caffeine for several days to a week, it acts as a diuretic, so it's going to increase the amount of fluid that you put out in excess of the amount that you're consuming. If you happen to have glaucoma, it might increase the intraocular pressure. It doesn't do that if you don't have glaucoma. The amount necessary for these complications or side effects seems to vary from person to person and has to do with your person, the individual's weight and sex and age and susceptibility and the liver metabolizing enzymes. In those people who, for whatever reason, seem to be predisposed to insomnia makes it worse. It increases the amount of sleep latency, the interval of sleep latency from the time you go to bed to the time you actually fall asleep can lead to a decrease in coordination, can cause some anxiety and some panic attacks. It might decrease your bone mineral density and lead to an increase in the fracture risk, especially in women, especially in those women who are predisposed to osteoporosis. But that can be reversed by two tablespoons of milk in your cup of coffee. And some people, as I said, have the sensitivity if they mix the alcohol with the caffeine, so that shouldn't be done. There's a modest increase at best in the blood pressure some people have an increase in their heart rate, and some individuals can have a supraventricular tachycardia speed up the heart rate, or ventricular tachycardia if it's consumed at a higher dose, or arrhythmias, especially in people who aren't accustomed to the coffee, to the caffeine. But as a matter of fact, they did a study in Boston in the coronary care unit and they gave the caffeine to individuals who were in the unit because of arrhythmias and they found that the arrhythmias didn't get any worse when they were consuming the caffeine. It seems actually that the caffeine acts as a vasodilator. It causes the production of nitric oxide. So for the overwhelming majority of people there's a benefit. Now some small number of people it may act on the muscle cells themselves as a vasoconstrictor and actually narrow the vessel. So you have to be a little bit careful. Well, pregnancy. Got to be a little bit careful in the amount you consume in pregnancy. As little is okay, too much isn't. If you consume too much, well, there's somewhere between a 20 and a 50% increase in the low birth weight, the number of low birth weight children, or the preterm births, or the loss of the pregnancies. But on the other hand, in preemies, in children who were born prematurely, it seems that caffeine can prevent and treat some of the lung problems like bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It improves the weight gain. It can decrease the likelihood of cerebral palsy. And it can prevent, although it can't treat, the apnea of prematurity. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics says children eh, probably shouldn't consume caffeine. So children and adolescents, they don't like it at the American Academy of Pediatrics. They say no place for use of energy drinks just shouldn't consume them. Evidence that it stunts the growth, not there. Increases the congenital malformations, nope, miscarriages, nope, growth retardation, nope. Does interfere with your sleep in some individuals who are sensitive to the effects. Alters the circadian rhythms. That's due to the way it works on the adenosine and the adenosine receptors. Well, could you get too much caffeine in overdose? Sure. And you can do that, especially if you consume some of the diet supplements or the stimulants or those people who are prone to seizures or ventricular arrhythmias. So if you look at the normal amount of caffeine, less than 400 milligrams, now let's say you consume somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 milligrams of caffeine a day, well, you can develop what we call caffeinism. And that's a situation where there's increased nervousness and restlessness and agitation and excitement and flushed face and GI disturbances and your muscles start to twitch and you have rambling thoughts and speech. 
suffer from insomnia and headache and palpitations and arrhythmias, seem to be inexhaustible. Well, uh, that's obviously very bad. And a high dose over 5,000 milligrams a day, that's halfway to the overdose level, the toxic overdose, the fatal dose. Then you can develop mania and depression, lapses in judgment and disorientation and delusions and hallucinations, and sometimes even muscle breakdown. And yes, there have been deaths reported for those people who consume too much caffeine. Each year, somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 cases are reported to different poison control centers in the United States. Somewhere around 800, 900 people hospitalized from too much caffeine. Several deaths are reported every year because of caffeine. No two cups of coffee are identical. So caffeine, you have to remember, is a natural substance. So when you get coffee, it all depends on the raw material that has to do with the species or the origin or the genetic traits of the plant, the agricultural practices, the traditional or is it organic. The harvesting, is it wet or is it dry? The duration and the conditions of storage, whether it's roasted light or medium or dark. And then we have the kind of roasting, is it the standard or is it with sugar? Then we have the type of coffee, whether it's going to be roasted or ground or instant, whether it's going to be boiled or filter or espresso. All of that makes a difference and that's why the coffee seems to be different. Well, the coffee comes from an unroasted bean, and the type of bean is either the Arabica or the Robusta. Those are different, and your gut microbiome is different. And the gut microbiome has a lot to do with the effect of the caffeine on your body. Now, people talk about coffee beans. They're really seeds, and the amount of caffeine in a coffee bean is about 1 to 1.5%. One present in the leaves of the tea plant, it's present in the kola nuts, in the South American holly yerba mate, the leaves, and it's the Amazonian maple guarana berries, all contain caffeine. Now interestingly, tea contains more caffeine than coffee per dry weight, but typically the serving size is less, the amount used is less. So there's more caffeine in your coffee than in your tea. And the color of the beverage doesn't tell you how much caffeine it has. So for instance, they have a pale Japanese green tea and it contains a heck of a lot more caffeine than the darker leaves. And interestingly also, by weight, chocolate has up to two times more caffeine than coffee, but you consume less of it. So a 28 gram serving of milk chocolate well, that's got about the same amount of caffeine as a decaffeinated cup of coffee. So you consume the caffeine. Goes in and 90% is absorbed through the stomach, upper intestine, within less than 20 minutes. It can be up to 45 minutes. Faster if you happen to chew gum that contains the caffeine because the mucosa absorbs it better. There's slower absorption if you have the caffeine with the meal. The peak plasma level is going to occur after about an hour to an hour and a half, and the caffeine is both water-soluble and lipid-soluble, so it's going to cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. The half-life of the caffeine depends on a variety of factors, but it averages somewhere between about three and seven hours. But in a preterm neonate, it could be up to 80 hours, but they get to adult level after about six months. In pregnant women and women taking the birth control pill, the half-life is slightly increased, and certain medicines increase it. For instance, Cipro, the antibiotic, or Cimetidine. And if you happen to take Luvox, the antidepressant, it can increase the half-life up to about 56 hours. And if you have liver disease, increase the half-life up to almost 100 hours. Increase the half-life if you have congestive heart failure, if you have acute pulmonary congestion. But on the other hand, if you're a cigarette smoker, it's going to speed up the metabolism of caffeine. The body's going to have a half-life of only about an hour and a half to maybe three hours. Certain medicines like Tegretol, Rifampin speed up the metabolism. And by the way, hyperactive children don't appear any more susceptible to caffeine than children without. Well, 
how is it metabolized? It's metabolized in the liver. And the caffeine's metabolized with an enzyme known as 1A2. That's one of the typical enzymes. We talk a lot about 3A4 and 2C9. Well, this is another one. And it seems that it metabolizes somewhere between about 95 to 99 percent of the caffeine you consume. It degrades it into paraxanthine, about 85 percent. That's going to increase the breakdown of the fats to theobromine. That's about 12 percent. Increases the urinary outflow, dilates the blood vessels. That's the primary form of the caffeine present in the cocoa bean and chocolate. And about 4% is theophylline. That's a relaxer of smooth muscle. We used that in the old days to treat asthma. But the amount that you get with a typical cup of coffee is nowhere near the therapeutic dose. Now, some people metabolize coffee differently. And that's because of the variation in the A12. It's present principally in the liver, some in the brain. But there are more than 150 different abnormalities of the 1A2, we call it single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNPs. And that alters the rate of metabolism. So some people can become anxious at a dose of 150 milligrams. Other people don't show any kind of change until they consume about 450 milligrams of the caffeine. And it seems that the 1A2, the activity of that enzyme varies with the circadian cycle, so it all depends when you drink your coffee. Now, the Food and Drug Administration limits the amount of caffeine that can be added to cola beverages to 0.02%. So that means, basically, that six milligrams is the maximum present in an ounce of soda. And the closest to the max is Pepsi Max. That actually contains 5.8 milligrams per ounce. But unfortunately, the beverage limitation does not apply to those products sold as dietary supplements. So it doesn't apply to Monster Energy or Five Hour Energy. 1994, the Food and Drug Administration said all these proprietary energy blends, they don't have to put it on the label. But in spite of that, we know that Monster has somewhere between 240, 280 milligrams of caffeine. So it's not for younger individuals, smaller individuals, people who have heart disease. Actually, there have been 13 deaths associated with Monster beverage, evidently, reported to the FDA. And the five-hour energy bottle, well, that contains about 215 milligrams of caffeine in two ounces. That's 19 times greater than the FDA limit for a cola, seven times more than in brewed coffee. But they advertise that, hey, it's just basically about the same amount as a premium cup of coffee over at Starbucks. But you go get a premium cup of coffee over at Starbucks, and you're not going to gulp it down. It's going to be too hot. So you're going to consume it over a slow period, a prolonged period. And you might even consume it with a certain kind of food. But with the energy drinks, not going to do that. Now the energy drinks not only have the caffeine, but sometimes they have some other ingredients. They contain some taurine or glucuronolactone or ginseng or ginkgo, or they have some green tea extract. But as I mentioned, the FDA said no to the combination of those energy drinks with the alcohol in 2010. They said the combination increased the amount of binge drinking, decreased the perceived intoxication. So people were drinking all this alcohol, but they didn't really realize that they were consuming as much alcohol because of the effects of the caffeine. And remember, the energy drinks don't have to list the amount of caffeine on the label, unlike the soft drinks. So if you consume a can uh, or bottle of the energy drink, that could contain as much caffeine as 14 cans of soda or five cups of coffee. And by the way, if you consume the caffeine, it's not going to help you sober up. Well, how does the caffeine work? It works on the adenosine receptors. And the adenosine receptors, again, there are more than 150 different SNPs of the receptors. And that's very important. And that's the variation of why some people seem to be susceptible to the effects of caffeine. Other people seem to be able to take the caffeine without any kind of problems. But it will change your sleep pattern. It has an effect on your memory. It has an effect on your learning. 
Now, the adenosine receptor where the caffeine works, there are multiple different adenosine receptors. It seems that it's the A2A receptor where most of the activity occurs. Now, if you use it on a chronic dose, chances are you're going to become tolerant to the autonomic nervous system effects. So you're not going to have the increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, increased urine output if you consume it for a long enough period of time. What about withdrawal from caffeine? Yeah, it happens. It really does happen. But it happens a lot less frequently than most people believe. Probably about 10, 11% of the people are going to have symptoms. But actually, only a half of the people who actually report withdrawal symptoms actually experience it. And the duration is less than a day. To make the diagnosis of withdrawal from caffeine, you have to have at least three symptoms. And the symptoms include either headache or lethargy, fatigue, or flu-like symptoms, or depressed mood, or difficulty concentrating, or irritability. And as a matter of fact, some people have some withdrawal just overnight. And that's why you have a cup of coffee in the morning. So you have a cup of the coffee in the morning so you can wake up and you get tired in the day because you haven't slept, so you have another cup of coffee, and now it interferes with your sleep at night, and the cycle continues. Can you become addicted to caffeine? The American Psychiatric Association says no. The International Classification of Diseases World Health Organization says yes. Well, once you consume the caffeine, then it works to prevent the adenosine that tends to make you sleepy, tends to prevent it from working. Well, additionally, it also leads to an increase in the amount of adrenaline that your body produces, increases the amount of dopamine, increases a variety of other substances well, changes the amount of phosphodiesterase in the body. Caffeine citrate is listed on the World Health Organization, listed by the World Health Organization, as an essential product. The caffeine that the plants make help protect it from predator insects, and the caffeine actually prevents the germination of nearby seedlings. Chemically, the caffeine is 137-trimethylxanthine, has a structure pretty similar to uric acid, but there's no evidence that it can be changed into uric acid or that if you consume coffee that it's going to increase the likelihood that you're going to develop the gout. Well, in your soda, it's added, as I mentioned, but they don't synthesize the chemical. They just take it out of a variety of other products. So when they decaffeinate certain products, that means they have a whole lot of caffeine left over, so they put it in other products. That's where it comes from. Well, we have the cola nuts and we have the cocoa beans. And then we have a history. And the history goes back where coffee was made illegal in the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century for some classes of people. King Charles II of England, he tried to ban it. Frederick II of Prussia, he banned it in the 1700s. In Sweden, they banned it from the 1700s to the 1800s. Thought it would cause some health scares in the United States in the early 1900s. It was isolated in pure form in 1819 by German chemists then came along two French chemists who actually got the credit for it because they used the term caffeine for the first time in print in 1821. German chemist, he actually got the Nobel Prize in 1902 because he synthesized from some of the components. He synthesized caffeine. Well, interestingly about caffeine, it's toxic to dogs and birds and cats and spiders. But on the other hand, it increases the reward memory of honeybees. So that's the story of caffeine. A lot of people think it's a harmful chemical, but it's just the opposite. It seems for the majority of people, it's either neutral or it's beneficial. So we do have significant health benefits associated with caffeine. However, if you happen to be one of those people who because of your liver enzymes or because of your adenosine receptors, you seem not to be able to tolerate it, stay away from it. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.